So there's two related functional groups um, related to imines that we want to talk about. Uh, the first is what's known as hydrozones. Okay, hydrozones. And so what this involves is taking a carbonyl and reacting it with a functionality called a, a hydrazine. Okay, so uh, this could have different levels of, of substitution, but, but this would suffice here. So a hydrazine is a molecule with uh, it looks like two amines that are stuck together with a single bond. So it's a nitrogen, nitrogen, single bond. Okay, that is a hydrazine. All right, and if we if we uh, mix these two together, and to be honest, this doesn't really even need a catalyst, um, but some some acid can catalyze it. Um, we will do the same type of imine formation reaction. Okay, it's the exact same mechanism. Uh, we're just utilizing one of the nitrogens, and then the substituent on the nitrogen is another nitrogen. Um, so otherwise, it's all the same. You go to this functionality, and this is known as a hydrozone. Hydrozone. Okay, so hydrazine goes to hydrozone, um, and again, this is this is exactly analogous to an imine formation. All right, so the hydrozone, um, and this uh, this um, functionality uh, is important for a couple of reasons. And one is that uh, hydrozone derivatives are sometimes useful for the characterization um, of carbonyl compounds. Um, so the, the classic one, um, which you, you might possibly do in your organic lab, um, has to do with the formation um, of a very specific type of hydrozone. So what you're gonna do here is, is to use a uh, the hydrozone that has two nitro groups on it, so it's it's the um, this di dinitrophenyl hydrozone, okay, um, two four dinitrophenyl hydrozone. It's a bit of a mouthful, um, but this uh, type of hydrozone um, tends to uh, be fairly crystalline, you know, so it's easy to crystallize. So you can convert a carbonyl uh, compound, which which may just be an oil or hard to work with, you can convert it to the hydrozone and make it into a crystalline material. Um, and these also um, have the, the property of being bright orange. All right, so these are uh, almost like um, traffic cone orange. And so this actually serves as a qualitative test to see if you've actually got a carbonyl compound. So if you have an aldehyde or a ketone in your molecule and you throw 2,4-dinitrohydrazine in with this molecule, it'll spontaneously form this hydrozone and the, the, um, the material will just turn uh, traffic cone orange. And obviously that's a very visual way uh, to, to confirm very quickly that you've got one of those functionalities. Now in terms of reaction chemistry, um, there, there's one bit of chemistry that we want to learn that actually involves a hydrozone um, as a key intermediate. Um, and this is something that's known as um, the Wolf Kishner reduction. Wolf Kishner. Yeah. And overall, what this reaction allows you to do is to take a carbonyl compound, ketone or aldehyde, and you react this with hydrazine itself. Right? So just NH2 N or H2 N NH2, right? Uh, so unsubstituted hydrazine, this is actually what would be used uh, in, in, as a rocket fuel. Um, but you throw in hydrazine uh, and then you also have a strong base, potassium hydroxide. And what this will do is it'll actually remove the oxygen. So it'll replace the carbonyl with just uh, saturated methylene. Okay, so you completely remove the carbonyl and make a, an alkane out of that. And then obviously in the case of an aldehyde, this is a, a carbonyl. Um, necessarily at the end of a, of a molecule, at the end of a chain. And so if you do this, what you'll get out is, is a methyl group, right? It's the same chemistry, it's just in these two different contexts. You either reduce in, inside the chain or at the end of a chain. Okay, well, how in the world does this work? This looks pretty bizarre. How does a Wolf-Kishner work? So I'm not going to go through the mechanism of the actual hydrozone formation um, because, again, it's exactly the same as an imine formation, um, although for practice you might want to, to run through that to see if you can do it. 
Um, but so we, we react these two and they will spontaneously form the unsubstituted hydrozone right, with this NH2 uh, there at the end. Um, and let me, let me actually explicitly draw these bonds here. So there's, a, there's going to be a proton there and a proton there. And what happens in the second step now is that the hydroxide, the potassium hydroxide that we threw in, is going to deprotonate that terminal NH2 group. Okay? It will be reversible. And that will get us to this anion here. So we've got an N minus. Okay? Now, normally uh, amines aren't very acidic. Right, so normally uh, hydroxide wouldn't be basic enough to deprotonate a, an, an amine, but notice in this case this isn't any old amine; it's actually part of a, um, a of a pi system, right? So this is analogous to the uh, allyl anion, um, and in this case we've got two nitrogens. So in this case this is acidic enough to allow hydroxide to deprotonate. So imagine here that we've got the, the uh, another resonance form of this um, of this system where we could actually draw the anion down at the carbon. Right? So I could push those electrons in, push them down to get this alternative resonance form. Okay. And so that would put my anion on the carbon. And so once I do that, what I can do is reprotonate. Okay, so this is going to be an equilibrium of deprotonation. And now this can also be an equilibrium of reprotonation. We're just, we're just basically isomerizing um, the, the hydrozone. Okay, so we'll, we'll deprotonate a molecule of water. Okay, so that gives us our carbon hydrogen bond there. And if you notice, we're getting real close again to forming a molecule of nitrogen. Remember, nitrogen is incredibly stable, it's a huge driving force if we can form it. And so that's basically what's going to happen here. Um, with the, the Wolf-Kishner reaction because we're going to now deprotonate a second time with hydroxides. So we're going to deprotonate again and now these electrons are going to dump in to form that um, nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond and that's the driving force to place the electrons in this nitrogen-carbon bond onto the carbon. Okay, so we actually go and form a full-fledged carb anion and N2 gas, off it goes, right? So, okay, we have formed a, a carb, carb, um, carb anion, which you know to be uh, very unstable. Uh, so we need a gigantic driving force to make this happen. Our driving force in this case is the formation of nitrogen gas. It's one of the most stable molecules um, that, that we know of, okay? And so that's the, the massive trade-off for forming the carb anion. Of course, as soon as you form the carb anion, you're in an aqueous solution, and this is very rapidly going to protonate, pick up that final proton, and then, lo and behold, you have formed your reduced product. You've removed that uh, that uh, oxygen entirely. Okay, so that's the Wolf-Kishner reduction. Um, it, it's it's a classic reaction, and it uh, would is not always appropriate for complex molecules because it's fairly harsh conditions to use um, this sort of harsh hydroxide and also to generate a carbanion. I mean, this carbanion is going to be reactive, um, so that's a consideration, but um, it's uh, actually a pretty uh, nifty way to remove a carbonyl entirely, okay? Now there's uh, one more related functionality um, that I want to mention. So we just talked about hydrozones. There's also a functionality called an oxime. Okay, so this is going to be a scenario where we take a carbonyl and instead of reacting with um, a hydro hydrazine, right, where we had um, the, the NH2 attached to another uh, amine, in this case, this is attached to an oxygen. So it's a, it's a hydroxyamine or, or in some cases, this could actually be a, an alkoxy, so we could have an alkoxyamine as well. Um, but if we react hydroxyamine with a carbonyl, um, again, the same, same uh, mechanism as the imine formation and as the hydrozone formation, 
we get to this. We got a carbon nitrogen double bond, and then the substituent on the nitrogen, instead of being carbon, is just hydroxy. Okay, so this is known as an oxime. Okay, and so oxymes are, are um, pretty stable, uh, like hydrozones are. Um, they're useful uh, end products in, in some cases. Um, but there's actually um, some useful chemistry that can happen with an oxime. And the one that I want to mention is something called the Beckman rearrangement. Okay, the Beckman rearrangement. So what you can do uh, with uh, an oxime here, R1, R2, is if you treat this with um, strong acid, and, and you know this is going to have to be something like H2SO4 um, in water, what you will get out of, of this reaction is a rearrangement product that looks like this. Okay, where one of the R groups, and it's the one that's trans to the hydroxy, um, will, will basically migrate from carbon to nitrogen, and then you'll, you'll get the a carbonyl where that group was. So that's a rearrangement, and it's a, it's a pretty, pretty bizarre looking reaction. But um, so how does this work? Okay, what happens is the oxime will react with this strong acid, with a strong proton. It actually will protonate on the hydroxy, okay? So as we've seen before, when you protonate a hydroxy, you get to uh, H2O plus, which you know can potentially be a leaving group. Now in this case, the way it can leave is to actually have this group here, this carbon-carbon bond, right, whatever this is, to actually migrate. It's going to do a one-two shift from carbon to nitrogen. So we're going to push it up like that, okay? It looks a little bit funny, I'm sure, but uh, it's, it's simply just a, a shift from one, one atom to the next. And essentially what it does is a backside displacement of that, of that water, okay? And so it kicks it off. And then if you, if you just simply follow those, those arrows, what you've got as an intermediate then would be this, um, this type of, uh, of intermediate. But notice that we just, we just ripped the electrons away from that carbon. And so this is now going to be, bear the positive charge. Right, so we just had water leave. Right, so we lost that electron pair from that carbon because it moved up to the nitrogen. So now this has to have the positive charge. And since there's a lone pair on this nitrogen, there's a resonance form that we could also draw where we would, we would have that re, uh, lone pair stabilize that positive charge. So we could actually draw a triple bond there as well. So this would also be a, a viable resonance form to draw. But we can use this resonance form to continue with the mechanism. All we're going to do, we have a very reactive cation, is we're just going to um, react that with water. Okay. Okay, so we get to this intermediate, and then the, the only thing to do at the end of the day um, is, is to deprotonate, okay, so we would get to to this intermediate, uh, but this actually is just a tautomer, a tautomer of an amide of a carbonyl with a nitrogen substituent, okay. And so there we go, so there's our amide, and that's how the rearrangement occurs. So we, we activate the hydroxyl, we have this one-two shift, and that's the weird thing. We have, you really haven't seen a lot of those, I think. Um, but it's just a, a one-two shift to kick out water, and then water traps the, the cation. And basically you tautomerize over to the amide. Okay, is this reaction important? Well, it actually turns out to be economically very important, and it's primarily for, for one specific reaction. So it turns out, if you take cyclohexanone and you convert it into its corresponding oxime and then do a Beckman rearrangement, okay, 
with, again, some acid and water, right? In this case, the migration happens as part of a ring. So it's a ring expansion, right? So carbon becomes attached to nitrogen. So we go from a six membered carbon ring to a seven membered ring that has a nitrogen. So at the end of the day, you're going to end up with this seven membered molecule. And this is actually called caprolactam. Why is this important? Well, this is what is um, used to make nylon, right? So um, in the previous video where I said that the billions of kilograms of cyclohexanone are produced every year because it, it is used to make nylon, this is how it's used. It's processed through a, a Beckman rearrangement to get to caprolactam, and then this gets polymerized to make um, a specific form of nylon. So uh, here's this, this oxy information that uh, has enormous economic uh, impact.